some of you think that investing into Alibaba is bad enough. Wait until you see this other Chinese tech mega cap that fell even harder than Alibaba in 2023. And yes, we are going to talk about JD.com today. So on a year-to-date basis, Alibaba is down 8.65%. Um, of course, it's red because if it's not red, it's not called Alibaba. But when you compare it with the two other fiercest competitors in China today, JD.com and Pintoto, JD is down a, a whopping 53%, while Pintoto is up 25.5%. So it's fairly interesting because we're going to investigate further into understanding why it's, why it's causing this disparity. And even though the three of them are in a similar industry, Alibaba is down, JD.com is down even more, but Pintoto actually experienced a 25% green year to date. Um, despite many of these doom and gloom naysayers um, saying that China is uninvestable. But also, um, one of the inspiration for me to do a deeper dive or deeper um, analysis piece onto JD was really because um, one of the super investors that I follow, which is Howard Marks, um, I love his memo, um, great stuff. He has recently entered into a JD position in the latest um, Q2 2023 report from Data Roma. So considering that I have a huge Baba position, many friends actually asked me about JD.com. And since um, they are very close competitors, I thought why not? Um, most Baba investors will probably be interested in understanding about JD as well. So now, what essentially happened? If you were to really track back into when JD just IPO'd um, back in 2014, um, they actually IPO in the US market first and then they seek a secondary listing um, in uh, the later part of 2020. So you can see that um, if you were to compare the, on the graph on the right, from 2014 to 2023, JD.com is essentially trading at the same price of $27 per share. However, I think one nuance here to take note is that the valuations are actually different. Why different? If you assume the share price of 104 Hong Kong dollars per share, um, they had around 2.73 billion shares outstanding back then. So that works out to around a 284 billion Hong Kong dollars market cap, which works out to around 36 billion US dollar. However, I think over the years, um, at least over the last seven to eight years, um, the share outstanding has actually ballooned from 2.73 billion to around 3.13 billion. So uh, even assuming at the same share price, but a different share outstanding, actually JD's um, valuation did increase. Albeit, some investors might argue that, hey, um, it's still trading at a dirt cheap valuation because how can it be possible that a company has grown by so much, by such a great extent, but yet at the same time, um, still trading at roughly the similar valuation. But that's it. I think all things considered, there's still a 14.65% increase in terms of share outstanding after eight years. And just of course, for some context, um, two Hong Kong JD shares is equivalent to one um, ADR, which is American Depository Receipt of um, JD.com, and they are fungible. Now, moving on to um, the past eight years, if you look at it in terms of their income and operating results, so revenue actually grew from strength to strength at around 88 billion Hong Kong dollars to right around um, 1.15 trillion um, Hong Kong dollars. So this is denoted in Hong Kong dollars. And similarly, on a net income basis, um, they were definitely um, loss-making because it was your typical tech company back then in 2014-2015. And right now, um, they are making a decent profit around $11.7 billion. So in 8 years, you can see that um, JD essentially 8x their revenue from 143 to $1.185 trillion, and also 12.6 times their gross profit from $7.5 billion to around, right around $95 billion. Even though we are dishing out huge numbers like 8 times, 12.6 times over a period of 8 years, um, I think the growth rate actually spells a different trouble and it tells a different story. You can see from 2014 all the way to 2019, 2020 even, um, growth rates were actually spectacular. From 60%, 50%, 30%, it re-accelerated to 50%. It hovered down to 20% and then it re-accelerated again in 2020, 2021 to 30 over percent. But that's it. I think there is some sort of a rounding error, but you just have to understand the bigger story that is governing investor psychology today. Um, basically, it's a growth story that turns sour. Um, typically like any other growth investment that had huge valuations run up and then it collapsed downwards again. Uh, most likely than not, um, it was a growth story or it was a growth stock that turned into a value stock. So the net revenue for the full year of 2022 was around um, 1 trillion RMB and that's an increase of 9.9% from the full year of 2021. So you should ignore this 1.42%. So some investors might argue and say that, hey, a 9.9% growth rate looks decent, right? Why is the market punishing them? So I think it's really an expectations and reality mismatch. Many early investors probably expect um, JD to be able to continue dishing out 20-30% growth rate, 
by in the latest um, work year, at least in the 2022 year, um, they only grew by 9.9%. And on top of that, I think the other argument is that um, the quality of their earnings is also um, going on a downhill, which I'll explain further later on. So um, I think long story short, the bottom line is that there is a re-rating in terms of growth expectations. So just to let you guys have a deeper appreciation, I think I do categorize um, the key challenges for JD moving forward into two big buckets. Firstly, I think it's really the idea behind competition. And competition is actually coming hard for the entire e-commerce industry, coming from newer entrants like Pintuotuo and also, more importantly, Douyin, which is the parent company of TikTok. So you can see, um, this is a graphic that was screen grabbed from a Goldman Sachs report back in September of 2022. Um, it was essentially discussing and describing um, the China's short-form videoization phenomenon and the entire uh, competition and competitive landscape in the e-commerce business. So Baba's market share has came down from 71% all the way down to 39%. Albeit, even though it's increasing, but um, you can see that it's kind of plateauing. JD on the other hand, which is denoted by this dark green um, figure, you can see that it started out at 22% and um, they are expecting or projecting JD um, out into 2024 or 2025. Um, their expected market share to still retain at right around 22%. But because of the entire Chinese e-commerce market just ballooning, um, even though they maintain a similar market share, um, they are able to retain or at least grow their profits. But I think at least for the current market consensus, I do believe that I've read from analyst reports that JD's current market share has actually went down to 18% and it is decreasing at a worrying trend. So if JD's market share continues to nosedive, then you know that um, JD might present as a value trap. Potentially, I'm not saying that it is a value trap, but if JD is unable to defend its market share, then um, we are probably going to expect revenue margins to continue being squeezed, revenue to go down, bottom line profits to be hit. So that's just some baseline context. And more importantly, I think the second part of the equation is that JD hasn't really been quick to adapt. You can see that in terms of the different platforms, um, the landscape is evolving accordingly. You can observe that live streaming is slowly taking out a huge chunk in terms of many of these e-commerce players. And at the start, really, it was only 3% that was in this um, business, which is Douyin, Kuaishou, and Taobao. And you can see JD Live. Um, JD is probably coming into the picture, but it's really, really very slow in terms of adapting to this new phenomenon of um, the entire e-commerce landscape. So which is why um, some people might argue that, hey, um, JD is very slow to the game. They are not adapting to their competitive pressures and they are still basically like a dinosaur company thinking that they're able to defend market share. So I'll leave it up to you to make the assessment, but this is really a very qualitative assessment. So I think there are two bigger judgment calls that you have to make here. Um, firstly, as an investor, do you think that the e-commerce platform and the e-commerce competitive landscape is going to morph from one of shelf to live streaming where competition is going to be fiercer and more people are going to migrate over to live streaming. And if that's the case, um, JD is really not in a good position to grab this new market share. And on the second part is whether JD's traditional platforms, which is the on-the-shelf um, sales, where it's very similar to Amazon's um, value proposition, um, people are going to continue being retained on um, JD's main platform because of their authenticity, because of their delivery networks and stuff like that. So you have to make the judgment on yourself on whether you think JD is able to capitalize and to drive on this um, e-commerce trend moving forward. So before we go on to the second key challenge that I see for JD.com, um, I think I just wanted to do a quick shout out for Funflix. Um, I've recently did a guest post on the website itself where I've written my Hai Ti Lao analysis. I know that some of the viewers have been asking for my own opinion. Um, do head over to their website. I do believe you have to create an account to read that article. But for now, it's a freemium model. But on top of that, I think just to share with you a little bit more about Funflix, um, I've met up with the founder. Um, he's also a fellow Singaporean investor that also invests in Singapore, Hong Kong, US stocks. And he probably identified a gap in terms of um, a lot of the Singaporean home-based investors, we not only invest in the US, we also invest in Hong Kong and even in our homegrown market. And there is not much um, analysis pieces or not much um, discussion around many of these stocks. So which is why he wanted to plug the gap. And he also had this very interesting idea of creating flicks where it's basically an animated video where he takes into account some of what the analysts have written and then turn it into a video format for those of you who are 
not too keen into reading lengthy articles. But yeah, I'll leave the link to the description box down below. And for those of you who are interested in the Hai Di Lao flicks, um, the founder has actually shared it with me. I'll leave it to the end of this video. So yeah, if you're interested, you can um, see what I have to say about Hai Di Lao. If not, um, let's get back into JD.com. So I think the second key challenge for JD moving forward is really the idea of their business model um, failing. Failing in a case where it really is not reflected or represented by the numbers that they're delivering in terms of both growth rates and also margins. So long story short, it's really the Amazon's commerce playbook not working out. And don't forget, JD is not Amazon and it's far from being Amazon. But moving back to JD.com, they're essentially copying Amazon's playbook where they're obsessed with the customer experience. They want to provide the best in town delivery network and which is why you can see that JD has went on to continue building up their entire logistics infrastructure and right now, I do believe that JD have the best-in-class fulfillment capabilities, even compared to Alibaba and Pintuoto, or even many of the other e-commerce business. However, the biggest issue right now is really this business model not working out as expected. So I think just to give you some context, um, just a brief rundown for those of you who don't really understand Amazon's retail business model. They basically just want to build up their in-house infrastructure network so that they can control in terms of their delivery time, they can control the people that that work for them, and they can control the entire quality from end to end, from um, the procuring to the selling to even to the delivery time. So that's why they have this um, vertical integration, which is what JD essentially wanted to do. So they've spent so much money in terms of capital expenditure to build out warehouse capabilities, etc., etc. So on the bottom line, I think this business model is pretty intuitive. If you have vertical integration, it means that you can probably control your delivery time and your entire customer experience. So that's why your customers will probably favor your business over somebody else, like probably Alibaba and Pintuoto, because they don't have their entire logistics network. And if JD is able to promise for maybe same day or one hour delivery, assuming that their entire logistics capabilities is so strong, then that it essentially will build up customer loyalty and people will essentially want to shop on JD more. However, if we were to really dive deeper into the numbers, it basically says otherwise in terms of this um, entire customer loyalty argument. So in the latest quarter, second quarter of 2023, um, their net revenue actually increased by 7.6% and net service revenue was the one that carried the entire earnings or revenue growth, where um, the net service revenue actually increased by 30.1%. JD Retail was the one that um, grew very little from 241 billion RMB to 253, but JD Logistics was the one that carried the growth from 31 billion to 41 billion dollars. So it, it begs the question, um, how is JD monetizing their logistics business and they're able to earn so much revenue, but yet at the same time, their own retail business, their own retail arm, not moving as much products? Because intuitively, um, your retail business is doing very well. That's why your logistics business is doing well as well. But that's it, if I may speculate, I think that JD is essentially trying to monetize their logistics network by allowing for other e-commerce operators and e-commerce platform to tap onto their infrastructure. So if you allow for such things to happen, then you are essentially not building your mode. You are giving your mode, your economic mode away because um, a lot of all this promise around, oh, I'm able to deliver under two hours. Your competitors are also able to promise that because they are essentially monetizing your infrastructure network. So if really that's how it's going to play out, then investors are probably going to second guess, um, thinking that, hey, am I investing in an e-commerce business or am I investing in a logistics business? And considering many of this heavy capital expenditure that JD is doing, looking at their competitors like Alibaba and Pintuoto that don't spend so much capex and they're able to also promise this sort of customer experience, um, no doubt people are leaving and there really isn't some sort of customer loyalty. So if I were to contrast this to Alibaba in terms of their growth rate, um, strip away other business segments of Alibaba, just focusing on their China commerce retail, their customer management revenue, CMR for short, is their advertising revenue. On a year-on-year -year basis, they actually grew 10% and for their direct sales segment, they also grew 21%. Compare it to JD.com, really, um, their net product revenue, where they are actually selling the products, it's not experiencing spectacular growth. In fact, if I were to do a quick division right now, um, the net product revenue actually only grow 3% year on year. So um, let's not forget that, hey, um, JD is of a much smaller base. Alibaba probably moved GMV double of JD and Pintuoto combined. So coming from a much smaller and weaker base, and you are growing much slower than Alibaba, it really begs the question, what exactly are you doing? Contrasting it to Pintuoto, I think they are of um, relatively similar base. Um, Pintuoto also experiencing explosive growth, which explains why 
um, pay total share price actually appreciated compared to um, JD.com and even Alibaba. So advertising revenue, they exploded from 25.2 to 37.9. And even for transaction services, they more than doubled. So it really begs the question, who is benefiting from this entire logistics infrastructure that JD has managed to build over the last decade or so? Is it JD themselves because they're able to expand their economic mode? Or is it these other competitors that are also tapping onto the infrastructure? But that's it. I think I just wish to put a caveat here. Um, I think it's a little bit too early to tell because um, JD might be playing the long game where they essentially continue to plow in money to build up their infrastructure network and allow for many of their competitors to tap onto their network where they start to build reliance. And moving forward, if one day um, JD decides to um, end the contract and to say that, hey, um, I'm not going to provide uh, many of my services, particularly so my logistic services to all these competitors anymore, um, then maybe um, the economic mode of JD can then be fully appreciated and be pronounced. But right now, it really seems disgusting that JD is unable to build any sort of customer loyalty. And I don't know, it really just seems like um, they're a logistics company for now. So moving forward, JD needs to prove two points. Number one, they have an alive and functioning business model, playbook or strategy. They have to address this competitive pressure and how they're able to continue earning um, super normal profits or accrue more shareholders' interest in the long run. And number two, they also need to kind of show that they are adaptable and they have decent enough advantage to re-accelerate growth. And ironically, like I alluded previously, they are the smallest in GMV amongst the big three e-commerce players, but yet they grew the slowest in the first half of 2023. So now, I think going on to the biggest buy argument by many investors in forums or even in my comments uh, in Twitter and YouTube, uh, people are saying that, hey, look at JD's valuations. Just look at it. You might change your mind. So just looking at the free cash flow generation capabilities, no doubt um, JD is pumping up a crazy amount or a great deal of free cash flow considering the valuations today. So their adjusted operating cash flow in RMB billions is around um, 57.6 billion. Let's take the 2022 figures. And free cash flow figure is right around 35.6 billion. So if you do net them out, they essentially spend around 22 billion in terms of capital expenditure. So I've did a very, very simple projection here using a very simple Excel sheet. This is the historical figures in terms of their cash from ops minus their capex and their free cash flow is on the bottom half. So if I have to project outwards, let's assume a few things. Firstly, they're not going to hit their peak adjusted operating cash flow figures. So in this projection, in the next five years, let's say that they're going to hover around 50 billion RMB. Um, no more, no less. Um, they're not going to grow their free cash flow generative ability as well. And for CAPEX, because there's an ongoing CAPEX um, requirement, made the assessment that yes, um, they're half a logistics company, half an e-commerce company. So let's say they need to put in 20 billion every single year. So that brings us to around a 30 billion RMB in terms of free cash flow. And let's use a discounting of a weighted average cost of capital of around 8% and a terminal multiple of 15 times. So 15 times actually makes it out to be around 6.66% of free cash flow yield needed as an investor. So convert them from RMB back to USD um, using the current total share outstanding, the current market cap and the share price of $27. The price target is around $35 with an upside of 30%. And this is considering the fact that, hey, we are using crazy um, assumptions where they're not going to grow anymore, which I doubt that. So some people might start arguing that, oh, a free cash flow terminal multiple of 15 times is too much. I think I'll leave it up to you to decide. But assuming that JD is able to consistently deliver 30 billion RMB free cash flow, I think 15 times is not too much of an ask. But I think the bigger worry here is really whether JD is able to consistently churn out this 30 billion RMB. If not, if this trend is on a downward trend, then yeah, JD is probably going to be a value trap. Now, moving on to this entire buy argument of JD's valuations today, this is part two of the valuation um, argument. If you were to just dive into the balance sheet of JD.com today, as of June 30th, 2023, cash and cash equivalent, restricted cash, and short-term investment, it works out to be around 32.42 billion US dollars. Yes, you have heard it right, $32.42 billion. And you have to go back and to see the current market cap is trading at 46.3 billion. 32 divided by 46, uh, yeah, around 75% of their value is in cash and cash equivalent. But I think that's it. There is a second part to this story because, of course, there is no free lunch in the world. Um, JD.com currently has quite a substantial amount of short-term debt and accounts payable. So that's something that most investors probably might want to take into account um, when looking at um, JD's current valuation. So really, is JD.com a buy? I think if you look at the two different cases, 
Um, I did make the assumption that they can at least make $30 billion RMB at around $4.11 billion US dollars in free cash flow every year. So in case one, if you net out the cash and cash equivalent of $32.4 billion, the current market cap of JD is around $14 billion. And at a $14 billion valuation net of cash, it's trading at 3.4 times free cash flow, assuming 0% free cash flow growth. So case two, if you take into account short-term debt and accounts payable, the current market cap of JD.com will, will work out to be around $37.5 billion. So at a $37.5 billion valuation, it's trading around 9.1 times free cash flow. Similarly, assuming a 0% free cash flow growth. But I think for me, a lot of people will be asking me, hey, so Chiking, so will you be buying JD.com today? I think there's a few bottom line caveats that you have to take into account today. First, JD.com indeed looks cheap. Um, I think it's a similar argument for many of these Chinese tech companies. Um, of course, if you were to ignore um, Pintoto because Pintoto is essentially on a tear, I think it 3x from its bottom, but that's besides the point. So JD.com, Alibaba, they all look cheap. But I think the second pointer, when you compare and you draw a contrast, the quality of JD.com today is really under scrutiny. So you might probably need to give it some time to prove whether it has a sound business model because the logistics network doesn't seem to be monetizing effectively at all. Um, and it doesn't accrue any sort of customer loyalty to their own in-house customers. And it probably need a lot of close monitoring and JD is probably not a buy, hold and forget type of investment. Um, on the fourth point, I think in terms of modeling with Excel, some of you might also get a false sense of security because it looks dirt cheap and um, there's a huge level of margin of safety as many of you like to quote it. But there's a really a very huge deciding factor, which is the exit multiple. And it really vary depending on how investors perceive the company's fundamentals a few years out. So going back to that Excel that I showed you, 15 times, some of you might ask me, hey, is it high, is it low? Um, the short answer is, I don't know. It really depends on what was the growth rate like um, in terms of free cash flow over the last five years or so. And what is the expectations on the ground between Wall Street? And that's when you get your terminal or your exit multiple. Of course, I won't want to answer, what would I do? Um, first and foremost, I think it can be a speculative bet. It can be part of your speculative portfolio where you think that you think it's cheap, you think that the Chinese economy might not be as bad, and you think that um, JD's long-term business model and trajectory is still intact. They're able to monetize their um, infrastructure network, and you think that um, there's a bigger plan moving ahead. So right now, all you're seeing is just bad numbers, but maybe moving forward, they're going to screw all the contracts with the different operators, and they'll be able to accrue customer loyalty back onto their platform again. And last but not least, I think I also just wanted to quickly go through um, why JD's stock price um, has essentially collapsed by such a large extent. Um, long story short, you can see that there's a huge drawdown from 30 over dollars and then just within one or two days, it dropped to 26 odd dollars. Um, it's basically Wall Street um, capitulating behind JD.com. So you can see that JD.com shares actually fell by more than 8% on Thursday as pessimism from Wall Street overshadowed a pledge from um, Chinese president to help spur the country's embattled tech sector. So investment firm Jeffrey actually cuts its price target on JD.com to $80 from 97, noting that revenue growth is likely to remain flat in the coming quarter. JD is trading at $27. They cut their um, expectation from 97 to 80. And even though at $80, it's probably still 2.5 times more than the current share price. Um, but the market is essentially not buying it. Um, they don't think that JD is so undervalued. So feel free to leave in the comment section down below what you think of JD today. And I'll see you in the next video. But more importantly, I will see you on the moon. Goodbye. Haidelau, a prominent Chinese hot pot restaurant chain, benefiting from the popularity of this dining style in China. What do company does? Haidelau excels in the highly competitive food and beverage industry due to its effective execution of the Golden Triangle framework. Location, replicability, and distribution. They benefit from customers cooking their food, ensuring consistency and taste. Hot Pot's popularity offers scalability, and Haidelau's strong company culture mitigates location disadvantages. Metrics The Chinese Consumption Purchasing Manager Index is under recovery. Haidelau has recently soared 16% upon expectations to report a 30-fold jump in first-half profit with diners returning to restaurants after lifting of strict COVID curbs. Haidelau's recent earnings was around 4.130 billion Hong Kong dollar which translates to around 27x price over earning ratio target price. Haidelau's valuations is around 23.20 Hong Kong dollar, with a 10% margin per safety per share, 
with the expectations of earnings normalizing rapidly in the next few quarters.